Washington took firm actions against Beijing last week, sanctioning 11 officials in mainland China and Hong Kong on August 7. China is usually of tit-for-tat nature on the diplomatic front and will retaliate with tough measures. Many of the sanctioned officials said that the motherland would protect them. With my country as a strong backing, I won't be intimidated by the futility of the so-called sanctions imposed by the United States. However, the events that occurred within the past few days will probably disappoint these officials extremely. The sanctioned officials include Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam, Director of Beijing, Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, Xia Baolong, and the Director of Liaison Office of Hong Kong, Luo Huining. They are responsible for undermining freedom and democracy in Hong Kong, and their assets and properties in the United States will be frozen. Some analysts believe that these 11 people were included on the U.S. Department of Treasury's specially designated Nationals and Blocked Persons list, which is the most severe list in the world. Drug lords and terrorists have been on this list. Bin Laden has also been on this list. Once on the list, sanctioned individuals can no longer have any business dealings or business relationships with the U.S., whether through directly or family-owned or through bank accounts or assets held by companies. Hong Kong's Attorney General's husband, Pu Lok Tu, who holds a 63.48% stake in the company Analog Holdings, announced on August 11th that he will sell its U.S. assets. U.S. news agency Bloomberg revealed that Citigroup and Standard Chartered are speeding up their review of customers at their Hong Kong branches, and that Citi has frozen the accounts of sanctioned officials. It's not only foreign banks that are abandoning these officials, but Chinese banks are abandoning these officials as well. Bloomberg reported on August 12th, major lenders with operations in the U.S., including Bank of China, China Construction Bank, and China Merchants Bank, have turned cautious on opening new accounts for the 11 sanctioned officials, including Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam, according to people familiar with the matter. At least one bank has suspended such activity. China's state-owned lenders need to preserve their access to global financial markets. China's four largest banks had $1.1 trillion in dollar funding at the end of 2019. Some analysts believe that there is a high likelihood that other Chinese banks will follow the lead of China's major banks in the future. For sanctioned officials, they may only be able to accept salaries in the form of cash. And for investment and financial management, they will have to travel to Iran or North Korea to do so. In addition, the New York Times revealed on December 12th that senior leaders of the Chinese Communist Party have been purchasing luxury houses in Hong Kong. The report identified Xi Jinping's sister, Xi Xiaoxiao, and a senior official, Li Zhanshu. Li is known as one of Xi's most trusted officials. Many CCP officials have been included in the U.S. sanctions list. It's possible that people within the Communist Party of China leaked secrets to the New York Times, hoping to put Xi's most trusted officials on the sanctions list. It can be speculated that the U.S. sanctions on Chinese officials will bring even more fear and trouble to the CCP. China, in an apparent tit-for-tat retaliation, sanctioned the same number of U.S. officials that the U.S. sanctioned of Chinese officials. On August 10th, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced 11 American officials were sanctioned, including U.S. Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley, and Pat Toomey, and also Representative Chris Smith. In addition, there are some members of American nonprofit organizations and human rights groups who are also sanctioned. After China sanctioned Marco Rubio, he tweeted, Last month, China banned me. Today, they sanctioned me. I don't want to be paranoid, but I'm starting to think they don't like me. Tom Cotton tweeted, China's sanctions won't affect me much, but we'll never stop fighting for the CCP's victims. It is the second time that Cruz, Rubio, Smith have been sanctioned by China. This makes China's so-called sanctions seem somewhat frivolous. It also seems that it may have been difficult to come up with 11 different U.S. officials without repeating sanctions on some of them. At the same time, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Communist Party of China did not specify the sanctions' exact measures, nor did it give any reasons on why officials were sanctioned. While many high-ranking CCP officials have luxury houses, large deposits of money, children, and mistresses in the U.S., American officials do not have these in China making it difficult for the CCP to sanction them. And also to the world's surprise, China did not sanction any Trump administration officials. 
Yeah, I think we're going to have an incredible year next year, but that will never pay for the loss of life in our country and all over the world. So we are — we view China differently than we did eight months ago. Very much different. Another recent act of a retaliation response by the CCP is the arrest of the founder of Hong Kong Next Media Group, Jimmy Lai, whose publication, Apple Daily, having a wide scope of influence in Hong Kong, have repeatedly been critical of many CCP's measures. On August 10th, the Hong Kong police arrested Lai, his two sons, and other high-level personnel of Next Media on the suspicion of colluding with foreign forces. Under Hong Kong's national security law, Endangering national security by colluding with foreign forces is punishable by imprisonment from three years to ten years. If the offense is serious, it is punishable by imprisonment for ten years to life imprisonment. Born in China's Guangdong province, Jimmy Lai stowed away on a ship and came to Hong Kong at the age of 12, during the time of the Great Famine of China. And later in life, he went on to become a successful media tycoon in Hong Kong. Presently, he has the option to immigrate himself and his family to other countries, yet he has chosen to stay in Hong Kong. He said, I came here empty-handed, and everything I got owed to the freedom of this place. Perhaps it is time for me to repay this freedom. On the same day, after Lai's arrest, Next Media stock unexpectedly surged 344%, reaching the largest turnover since its listing in 2000. The next day, after the first batch of Apple Daily newspapers went out onto the street, the demand was so great that it exceeded the paper's supply. The newspaper had to be printed even more. Apple Daily reached 550,000 copies of distribution that day, five times the usual distribution. The international community has been paying close attention to this incident. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence said in a tweet that the arrest of Lai is deeply offensive and an affront to freedom-loving people around the world. The Senate, the country, and freedom-loving nations across the world stand with Mr. Lai and with all the peaceful demonstrators who've met the business end of the CCP's repression. Article 42 of the Hong Kong National Security Law states that bail will not be granted unless the judge has substantial grounds to believe that the defendant will not continue to commit acts that endanger national security. Forty hours later, however, Lee was released on bail. It appears that under international pressure, the CCP is now treating Lai more flexibly than it does its own officials. In observation of China's conduct, a predictable pattern becomes apparent in the style of its diplomacy. This has been the case recently in Canada after the arrest of Meng Wanzhou, CFO of telecom giant and China's largest privately held company, Huawei. She was arrested at Vancouver International Airport on a provincial arrest warrant under the terms of an extradition treaty between Canada and the United States in regard to breaches of U.S. sanctions against Iran. Washington submitted a formal request to have Meng extradited to the U.S. to face charges of stealing trade secrets, bank fraud, and money laundering. In an apparent retaliation for the CFO's arrest, China arrested two Canadian citizens, Michael Spavor and Michael Korvik, on espionage allegations in December 2018. On June 24, 2020, Zhao Lijian, spokesman for China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in a press conference, admits a connection between the two Michael's arrest and Meng's arrest. Zhao, commenting on the reports in the Canadian media of a legal opinion that says Ottawa has the authority to intervene in Meng's extradition case and set her free immediately, said such options would open up space for resolution to the situation of the two Canadians. Uh, that this issue of uh, China trying to exert political pressure on Canada by having arbitrarily detained two Canadians in response to us fulfilling obligations under an international extradition treaty is uh, causing a challenge in our relationship. We will not uh, give in to these political pressures and compromise the independence of our judiciary. Recently, China sentenced a third and a fourth Canadian to death over drug charges. 
A court notice in the province of Guangdong said Yi Jianhui was sentenced on Friday, a day after another court sentenced Xu Weihong. Last year, two Canadian nationals were also sentenced to death on similar drug charges. China's foreign ministry spokesman Wang Beibin said in a press briefing on August 7th that there was no connection between the sentencing and current Canada-China relations. However, he later said at the same press briefing that the Canadian side knows the root cause of the sentence, hinting that the sentencing is retaliation to Meng's arrest. The Canadian Ministry of Justice recently submitted a new document to the court regarding the Meng case. Which was made public to the media on July 31st. The latest document outlines the evidence supporting the detention of Meng and concluded that the pre-trial conditions have been met. The hearing will be held in April 2021. The Trudeau government has a much softer approach to Beijing than the U.S. Canada's two largest telecom operators decided in June this year to partner with Ericsson and Nokia to build 5G networks. So far, the Canadian government has not made a decision on whether Huawei will be allowed to supply equipment for the country's 5G network. Of the Five Eyes Alliance, only Canada has not explicitly stated its position on banning Huawei's 5G. Some analysts believe that the different retaliation attitudes that the CCP has shown the world may not be a bad thing, as it may quickly persuade those who hold aspirations for the CCP and the Chinese market to part with it.